So today, what we're doing is we are in our final installment of this series, Fight for Joy. How many of you guys have enjoyed this series? Anybody here enjoyed this series? How many of you guys have discovered that to have joy in your life, it really is a fight? It really is a fight. And in a minute, we're going to be in Philippians chapter number two. But today, I want to speak to you just for a few moments on this thought, the secret of practicing joy. You know what it is? It's humility. The secret of practicing joy, humility. Has anybody taken the challenge to read the entire book of Philippians It's only four chapters long, take you 15 to 20 minutes. If you have taken that challenge and you've read it, as you do read it, you'll you'll read that Paul says over and over again to rejoice. He'll tell us over and over again to, uh, to, to have joy. And he talks about really this discipline of joy 16 different times in this small little book. And we talked about in one of those earlier messages how happiness is so much different than joy. Because happiness is basically based on things that happen in your life that are good. We all like for good things to happen. We all like to be happy. But how many of you guys know that you're not totally in charge of everything that happens in your life? Joy is so much different than happiness because joy is actually a choice that you have to make every single day of your life. And joy is actually a spiritual discipline that you have to develop as a Christ follower. And we have to remember that Paul, um, he tells us to rejoice. He tells us to be joyful, not in a happy place. In fact, Paul, whenever he writes this letter to the church at Philippi, he writes it from a place where he is in a prison cell awaiting to be executed. Really, if you think about it, Paul's the one that needs to be encouraged. Paul's the one that needs to have somebody, you know, speaking into his life. But really, as Paul thinks of himself less and speaks to others about joy and about Jesus and about the power of the Holy Spirit, it gives him the strength that he needs to be able to walk down this fight and fight the good fight of faith. And I think really, as we think about where Paul's at, as he sits in a jail cell for something that he did right, As he's sitting there writing these words, it really ought to speak to each and every one of us, whether you're on the mountaintop or you find yourself in a valley. And and it ought to speak to us this way, that there is joy for your journey every step of the way. Joy is one of those things, my friend, please understand this, that if you do not practice it, that if you not take it as a spiritual discipline, if you don't take it seriously, you will miss out on one of the most important gifts that Jesus died to give us. The Bible, in fact, says the joy of the Lord is your strength. So in order for you to last in this thing called Christianity, in order for you to have strength through the long haul, my friend, you and I have to learn to practice joy. And that's really what the Apostle Paul is trying to show us as he sits in that jail cell, as he bound the chains. What he's eventually saying is this, I'm not going to let these chains steal my joy, but I'm going to let my joy break these chains off of me. In fact, last week what I tried to do was I tried to illustrate that point by bringing in literal chains. And when you think about those chains, chains are weighty. Chains make us uncomfortable when they're up on us. Chains are loud when they, when they crackle with each other. But Paul says this. Paul says, you know what? I'm not going to let these chains steal my joy, but I'm going to let these, my joy break these chains. But really, I was thinking about chains even more so. And really, chains are just really challenges that get in the way of our joy. That's all they really are. We had a staff meeting this past week, and everybody was sitting around a circle, and I kind of ask everybody, how's how's everybody's joy this week? And Chase kind of laughed and he said, well, it really just depends on the day, Travis. It really does. And it's true. He's right. It really just depends on the day. Nobody can say with all honesty that they don't ever really struggle with having joy in your life. And maybe you're here today and you're not in literal chains like Paul was, but I bet if I were to talk to many of you personally, you could tell me about some struggle that you're dealing with. You can tell me about some mountain that you're facing. You can tell me about some addiction that you're trying to overcome. And something else I notice about whenever you're battling joy, a lot of times something that stills our joy or something that a joy barrier you might have, it seems to be other people. I don't know. It seems like we we all, 
in this life seem to have people problems. You know why? Because relationships can get sticky and it can seem hard to choose joy in a relationship. Whether that, because you go through different seasons with relationships, whether it be with your spouse or your kids or your friends or your coworkers or classmates or whoever it might be. I don't know what it is that comes in between you and choosing joy in your life, my friends, but I know oftentimes it's just other people that we got to deal with in life. And Paul was no different. Paul had people coming down on him all the time. The government was always coming down on Paul. People had his very best friends, people that he thought would never leave him, turn their back and walk away from him in the faith. There were people in the church in the faith. When Paul would preach, they totally misunderstood Paul. So the question that I have is this, how was Paul able to tell us time and time again to rejoice even in the midst of such difficult circumstances? I really believe, my friend, that Paul was able to tell us that because, because Paul chose not to think about himself all the time. But he chose to think about other people. Paul chose to walk in humility and nearly not even focus on what was in front of him, but he chose to focus on who was walking with him through whatever he was walking through. So what does humility look like? Well, if you were to define humility, Webster defines humility this way, to have a modest or low view of one's own importance. I like that definition. I think it's a good, solid definition. I like what Rick Warren said about Humility, he said this, he said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's just thinking of yourself less. I thought that was good. And by the way, Paul didn't live in a world where humble people were admired. Paul didn't live in a world where humility was saw as a strength. In fact, humility was saw as a weakness because he lived in a time in Roman culture where if somebody showed great humility, they were saw as a weak person because he lived in a culture that said, hey, put yourself first. Just think about you and you only. That's the kind of world Paul lived in. A whole world revolves around you. And I don't think you have to be a social scientist to recognize and realize that's the same kind of society that we live in today. When you think about advertising, when you think about our culture, our society, when you think about social media, my friend, there's this constant push to put you in the center of everything. It's just the world we live in. In fact, I think I shared this years ago, but I I read an article about a group of people who were members of a dating website and they asked thousands of members of this dating website a number of questions. They said, hey, just respond yes or no to these questions. And one of the questions was this, are you a genius? Yes or no, just answer, are you a genius? And this survey was taken by thousands of people, but the men especially stood out with this question, are you a genius? Because believe it or not, two out of five men said, they, are you a genius? Two out of five men said, well, you know, I... That's almost half. I guess if you're going to really corner me, I get, I'm a genius. I guess you're just going to have to. Yep, I'm a genius. But can I tell you, statistically speaking, the fact of the matter is this. One out of every 1,000 men are a genius. And I love the way this article put this at the end. It said this. It said that two out of every five men consider themselves to be one in a 1,000. And I thought, man, that's pretty good. I thought, you know what? That sounds about right, though. Because many times we really don't have an accurate view of ourselves. We have a view as we see ourselves, but it's not really an accurate view. That's probably why Paul writes Philippians chapter 2, and he spends most of the time writing Philippians chapter 2 about humility, because Paul knows a secret. And he knows the secret is this, that it's humility that leads to true joy. So let's pick it up today in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Everybody ready? Say we're ready. Here's what it says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ Jesus, if you have any comfort from his love, if you have any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of of others. So maybe as you hear that, maybe as you hear the definition of humility and what it is, maybe you're starting to realize that humility is the pathway that leads to joy. But the question is this, how do I get humility? I mean, I saw that definition, Travis, I agree with it. I, I believe that we don't live in a world that 
that's full of joyful and humble people. Can I tell you, the truth of the matter is we live in a world that's exactly opposite of that. We live in a world where people are trying to find happiness in everything the world has to offer. In fact, we live in a world where depression is higher than it's ever been in the history of this world. We live in a world now where addiction is at the highest rates it's ever been. We live in a world now, my friends, where people are trying to find happiness in everything the world has ever has to offer. So the question is this, how do I get humility? And Paul gives us the answer right here. Real humility is truly a response to what God's radical love towards you. Let me say it again. Real humility, my friend, is a response to God's radical love towards you. I believe you got to start right there as a believer every single time. If you want to walk on that humble path, please get this. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it in your own effort. Paul says, look at how God pursued you. He says this, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have ever found any comfort from the love that Christ has shown you, if you have ever had any common sharing of the Spirit or felt any tenderness or compassion from Jesus, what's Paul doing here? He's talking about the initial pursuit of Jesus towards you. You don't wake up one day and decide you're just going to be humble, my friend. You have got to receive God's radical love in your life. Be filled with his spirit. I just can't will myself to be humble and think of myself less, my friend. It's a response to God's love towards you. Can I get an amen? That's what it is. And the truth and the fact of the matter is this. That's a daily decision that you and I got to make. To lean into scripture. Make it a priority. Lean into prayer. To be made and molded into the likeness and image of Christ Jesus himself. You filter your thoughts that way. So what are the marks of humility? What are they? I'm going to give you a few things to think about this morning. The first thing we want to focus on is this. Humility is not grasping, but it's surrendering. Humility is not grasping, it's surrendering. I think when you think about humility, there's this phrase that we all have heard before, and it's called false humility. And that's when you're just concerned that other people think you're humble. Can I tell you, that's not, that's not humility, that's false humility, because the truth of the matter is you're only thinking about yourself. And the fact is, that's really just pride. That's what that is. But something I've noticed is when I meet a humble person, and they might be very successful, they might be the smartest person in the room, they might be a leader of some kind, but something I've noticed about their humility is this. They are unimpressed with themselves. They're unimpressed with their accolades. They're unimpressed with what they've achieved. They're unimpressed with their status in life. Their decisions aren't just focused on, on their needs, but, they're, but, they're, but their decisions are focused upon the needs of other people. And when you think about your life, think about it just for a second. You've got short-term needs and you've got some long-term needs. And so oftentimes, our short-term needs, they clash with our long-term needs, my friend. Short-term needs are this. Man, I need to do this right now, but long-term needs are, man, I need to become this person every single day. But God, can I tell you, doesn't want our short-term needs needs and our long-term visions to clash with each other. He wants us to understand that the, that the sacrifices that we make in the short term, that's what makes long-term lasting impact in our lives. The devil and the enemies of hell would let you think you got all the time in the world to do everything you need to do. And all the while, you'll look back on your life and say, where did my life go? I'm telling you, my friend, you start doing and, and acting according to what God called you to do right now in the short term, and that's how you make a long-term impact. It's just a decision to trust him day by day. Not trying to prove my worth by what I do, but rather it's when we surrender what's on the inside of us for the sake of others. I'm not grasping. I'm just simply choosing to surrender what God's put inside of me to people around me. If you want to have a long-term position on humility, my friend, please get this. It comes from a mindset. And Paul drills this home in verse two of this passage. He says, make my joy complete, watch this now, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and here it is again, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourself. Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. We just read this definition from Webster's and I think it's a good definition. I think it's a valid definition. But I honestly don't think it speaks to the totality of what a good definition of what it means to be a Christian 
and operating in Christian humility. Webster says humility is when a person has a low view of one's own importance. But my friends, that's not the whole picture of what we just read here because Paul says it's not just about you uh, not focusing on yourself, but there's another step. You say, what's that other step? He's saying you're not just focusing on yourself, but you're being outward focused. And you might say, Travis, I'm not trying to gain a whole lot of glory. I'm not trying to get on a platform. I'm not trying to be first. I'm not trying to do any of that. Let me tell you something, my friends, that's good and that well, but I will follow it up. If you are a Christ follower, if you are a Christ follower, then this, this is what I got to ask you. Who are you focused on then? What are you giving to then? What are you surrendering and sacrificing your life for, my friend? Don't miss out on the power that Paul is trying to get through to us right here and right now. He's, he's, he's in a jail cell. He is in chains. And he's saying, don't, I know it sounds so countercultural right now. He says, don't look to your own interests, but each of you look to the interest of others. Humility, true humility, is measured by your love for others in action. In action. That's true humility. It gets even better. Is anybody enjoying this as much as I am? I hope so. Here we go, verse five, it says this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made or born in human likeness. This passage of scripture you've probably heard before because it's really one of the richest theological passages in all the Bible. And Paul says, you know what? I'm just not going to tell you to think less of yourselves, but I'm going to give you the greatest example that have ever lived, and that is Christ Jesus himself. Paul talks about the pre-existence of Jesus. Paul talks about the birth of Jesus, the sinless life of Jesus. He goes on and talks about his death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And you say, how does that relate to you and me today, Travis? Jesus is the perfect picture of humility. Jesus had every reason and every right to take and to grasp everything that he could, but he didn't do it, my friend. And Paul says, look to the example of Jesus because he's the greatest example of humility that has ever lived. And did you notice something that Paul said? He says, have the same mindset, the same mindset as Christ. And I don't think he's just talking about your passing thoughts that go about your day, but it's really something much deeper. Can I just be honest with you guys? You choose, you choose the pathway of thoughts that you go on. You choose your thoughts. Let me say it another way. Your thoughts put you on the direction of your life. Your thoughts do that. They think, they start up here. If you don't like where your life is at right now, let me ask you a question. What are you thinking about? Your thoughts direct your path. Your thoughts put you in a direction for your life. If you don't like where you're at, look at your thoughts. He says our mind, our mindset ought to be that as of Christ Jesus. And the reason why he says that is because our thoughts go in a hundred different directions. Our thoughts go to this, our thoughts go to that. And we're so far off of God's plan and God's path for our life. He says our mindset ought to be the same as Christ Jesus. What was Christ's mindset? He chose to be selfless rather than selfish. Every day you and I get up, we have a choice to make two decisions. Are we going to be selfish or are we going to be selfless? Selfish or selfless in our conversations and how we deal with conflict and how we talk to other people. What are we going to choose? Because every day we have that choice. What did Christ choose? Christ chose to be a servant, my friend. Why would Jesus do that? Because he walked in humility. He was thinking about you. He was thinking about me before he was ever thinking about himself. Can I get an amen? He goes on in verse six and says this, who being the very nature of God, I love this, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made or born in human likeness. Did you guys catch this phrase? He says this. He says, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or something to be used for his own advantage. What does that mean, Travis? Well, I believe it means that, that Jesus wasn't trying to be God. 
He wasn't trying to be God. Instead of reaching for greatness, instead of striving to gain greatness and glory, what did Jesus do? He surrendered his life. He poured his life out. And by emptying himself, what did he do? He showed his equality with God like nothing else could, my friend. What is what is Paul trying to reveal to you and I today? He says, if you really want to know who Jesus is, look to the cross. Look to the cross. There's no greater example of his, of his arms stretched as wide as they could stretch as his blood poured out for you and for me. It's because the only thing that could wash away your sins was nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that proved that he was God. Who do you think the God of this universe really is? You think that Jesus called his way to the top? You think Jesus opposed every person that came against him? Of course not, my friend. He is God because he poured his life out, because he gave you what you can never give for yourself. He gave you peace that you can never give. He gave you salvation, a home in heaven that you can never give for yourself, my friend. That proves that he is God in the flesh, my friend. He wasn't grasping. He was surrendering and he was sacrificing. Could we give a great big round of applause for what Christ did for us? Paul urges us to take on this mindset of Christ. So how do we think less of ourselves? Do we do it by grasping? Do we do it by pushing our way forward? No, we do it by surrendering. We do it by, by emptying ourselves every single day. And I'll just tell y'all something. I can't, I can't pour out your cup for you. I could want it for you as, Chase could want it for you as bad as we could want it for you. But I can't, he can't, we can't do it for you. But I can't do it for me. I can't do it for me. I can take what God gives to me and I can pour out love, forgiveness, sacrifice, service to people around me. The same way that Jesus, to the best of my ability, I'm not perfect, I got a long way to go. I'm work in progress, anybody with me? But to the best of my ability, when you have the mind of Christ, you think less of yourself and more about others. And what can you do? You can love, you can serve, you can forgive. You can sacrifice. But nobody else can do that for you. That is only something you can do. We're just going through this passage. Everybody still with me? Today's, you can't be mad at me because today's Pastor Appreciation Day anyway, amen. Anyway. Let me give you the second mark of humility. Here it is. Humility is following the path that Jesus has called me to. Very simple. Humility is simply following the path that Christ has for my life. Look at verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself. I become obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted Jesus to the highest place. And he gave him the name that is above every name at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven on earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And somebody say amen. amen. Oh, man. Humility is simply following the path that Jesus has called me to. It's when I say, you know what? I'm going to obey God even when obeying God makes me uncomfortable. I'm going to obey God even when my flesh tells me to do something else. Can I just tell you guys something? Please get this. The greatest opportunities of your life will always be on the other side of obeying God. Let me say it again. The greatest opportunities of your life will always be on the other side of the cross. It will always be on the other side of obeying God. Give me an example, Travis. Okay, look at the example of Jesus. He was not named the highest name. He was not given the highest honor in the hall of heaven. He was not given the name above every name until after the cross. Therefore, because of this, he was given the highest name in heaven and on earth. It was after the cross, my friend. It was after he, had, he went on that path that God had for him. I was trying to think of a way I could illustrate this. And, um, and I was reading an article this past week, and the article kind of dived into Roe versus Wade. And I was horrified to read that 67% of women who find out they're pregnant with a baby that has Down syndrome aborts the baby. And I thought about that. And I thought, man, why, why would this be? And the only example I could, the only reason I could come up with it's because somebody has convinced them that to have a baby with Down syndrome would decrease their joy. 
Tyler, they with Down syndrome, it would make it too uncomfortable for them. And I, I just want to qualify this, and I'm not trying to shame nobody. I'm not trying to embarrass nobody. In fact, I'm trying to encourage your faith. But can I tell you, if God blesses you with a baby that has Down syndrome, something tells me that child is going to teach you more about joy than anything else in this world can teach you about joy. In fact, I found this short little video clip that I want to share with you that I think illustrates this very well. I tell you what, that 80 year old dad and that 55 year old son, I have a feeling that 80 year old dad learned a lot from that, that child. Don't you about joy? And I guess it kind of hits home for me a little bit because when my wife, when she was in her mother's womb, her mom's name's Janet, my mother in law's name is Janet. It was a very difficult pregnancy for Janet. And they did some tests and they came back and told Janet that if this baby survived at all, it was going to be have severe mental disabilities. And then he said in the very next sentence, but you have some options. And Janet said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you could terminate this pregnancy. And Janet said, there's no way I could ever do that. And I, for one, am glad. I wouldn't be up, I think about my beautiful wife. She was born perfectly healthy. I would say, you know what, don't always take a doctor's opinion. Let me tell you something, there's another doctor up in heaven who has another opinion. Can I get an amen? And I tell you what, I can't help but think about how much joy Michelle has brought into people's lives. And I'll, be, I'll speak for Chase and everybody else that has a spouse that's on staff, and I think all of us do. We're not up here without our spouses. We can't do without our do without our spouses. It's just the way it is. And then I also think about my, my mom, I had an aunt that had Down syndrome. Her name was Aunt Barb. And I tell you what, man, I think sometimes people think about this path that God has them on, and the only thing they can think about is what's this going to cost me? How much is this going to take? But let me tell you something, my friend. There is nothing, there is nothing, nothing in this world. I tell you what, when God has you on a path, I tell you what, there's, no, there's, there's so much security. There's so much God confidence knowing that, hey, I am on this path that God has for me. No matter what else is going on around, God has me on this path, and this is the direction I'm going. And that's, there's nothing greater than that. If you want real joy in your life, my friend, it's not deciding your own journey. It's you trusting in God, knowing that he's in control, knowing that he is the one that created you, knowing that he's the one that knows the best path for your life. Even during those times of suffering, just like Paul here, I don't have to try to manufacture some kind of happiness. I don't have to try to manufacture some kind of joy through a pill or a bottle. Guess what? I can find joy because guess what? I've got Christ and I've got Jesus. And because I am, I have true and real joy. He's the one that created me. He's the one that loves me. He's the one that died for me. Man, and he's the one that's leading me too. Humility is grasping. It's not grasping. It's not, it's not striving, it's surrendering. Humility is following the path that Jesus has called me to. Let me give you one last thought. Is this helping anybody? By the way, okay, all right, I got four hands, that's good. Humility doesn't flash, it shines. Humility doesn't flash, it shines. Look at verse 12, therefore my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence now, much more so in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
For it is God who works in you too willing to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. I didn't get one amen on that one. Huh? So that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life and that I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. I, I think I love this part of this passage because you can see how much Paul loves the church. You can see how much he loves the people that he gets to serve with and just worship the Lord with. Even though they're separated, you can still hear his heart for him. He says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to willing to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. When he says to do so with fear and trembling, it doesn't mean like being scared to talk to someone or being afraid to have a conversation with someone. He, when he talks about fear, he's talking about being in awe that God would even save you because there's nobody that knows you better than you. And you let that all just think, wow, God, I can't believe you. You love me that much that you literally saved my life. And can I tell you, my friend, when you let that all of the presence of God in your life, that's what gives you courage. And that's what gives you strength to bring this message wherever God sends you. That's what does it. I believe, honestly, what Paul's saying is this, in this passage, and he's speaking to the church. He says, get back with being the Lord's people. Stop backing away. Stop making excuses. He says, work this thing out. Don't be just one bold flash. Don't, yeah, commit your life to Christ. Get baptized, and we never see you in it again. He says, shine brightly for Christ. Don't be one, one bold flash. Like, wow, here he is. Where did he go? I've never seen uh. He says, no, let your light shine brightly for him. How do you shine brightly for Christ? You work it out. You work it out. Paul's saying, hey, God will help you to do the work, but you have to do the work. God will help you do the work, but you've got to be willing. He, you, have to, you have to be willing to put in the work. And then he tells us what, what all this is all about. He says it's for the good purpose of God. Now watch what he says in verse 14. This is probably many of your guys' favorite verse. He says, do everything without grumbling or complaining. Now, I'll be honest with you, when I first read that, I thought that was a misprint. I thought, how in the world did they get that messed up? Do everything, do everything without grumbling. I just want to make sure I'm reading this right. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Would everybody say everything? Now, when he says everything, that pretty much means everything. <laughs> that pretty much doesn't leave us any room for complaining, which is grumbling. That pretty much doesn't leave us any room for quarreling which is arguing. And remember, he's talking to the local church because here's the reason why he writes this to the church of Philippi because if you go on and read the rest of this book, you'll find out that there's a, they have some quarrels. They have some complaining going on in the church. In fact, if you read chapter four, you'll find out that there's two ladies arguing with each other. Can you guys believe that two women would argue with each other in church? I know that's probably hard for you to believe, but it's absolutely true. In fact, in fact, these two ladies, one of their name was Euodia and the other one's name was Sintiki. And you, Paul finds out that they're arguing with each other. And he says, you know what, guys? You need to work it out. There's too much at stake. He says, work it out. And I often wonder why Paul would all the, he would make some of the most powerful declarations and theological doctrinal statements of our faith right in this passage, right in the midst of that. He writes something as practical as do everything without complaining and arguing. Why would he say that? I think it's because Paul understands and understands and knows that the greatest attack against the body of Christ is when Christians give up working it out and they just jump to arguing and complaining and grumbling and gossiping and backbiting with each other. Can I remind you all about something? You are not called just to yourself, that there is a great big world watching and listening to everything that you're arguing, complaining, and gossiping about until eventually a lost and dying world just turns their back on the church and turns their back on Christ and walks away completely. Many people, they come to church, and I've heard about it, and they told me, they said, man, I'm, I went to church for a while, but man, there's just so much gossiping and so many critical people, negative people, man, I just, and I thought, man, 
those people were never even to scratch the surface of what God called them to do. Can I ask you a question? How are you going to shine brightly for Jesus in this dark and ugly world if you're not committed to working it out? You got a question, ask somebody. You have a dissension with somebody, do what the Bible says and go to that person and talk to them about it. Because if you don't work it out, it just festers and it just grows and it just, and then, and then separation happens and then other things get, and it just, you know, we'll have our grandkids. We had them this weekend. We love to have our grandkids and, and, um, and normally we have them for two or three days, but every once in a while we'll have them for a little extended period of time. I don't know about your guys' as kids, but we have for a little extended period of time. Guess what? They can start to bicker and complain and argue with one another. I don't know if your guys' as kids are like that, but our grandkids are like that. They can start to really, and we took our grandkids to New York. We had them for five or six days to see their aunt Sid. We had a great time, but we had one moment when they just start arguing with each other and they would come to me and say, hey, hey, Papa Trav, uh, Quincy did this and Sophia did this and this person did this. And finally, I just got sick of I got tired of it. I said, hey, don't come to me anymore. You guys are going to have to go over there and work it out together. And can I tell you all something I believe is this relationship to the church? God says don't walk it out, work it out. Don't walk out, work it out. Church isn't made of perfect people. We're nothing but sinful people being formed into the likeness and image of Christ. We make mistakes. You got an issue, you got a problem, work it out. Work it out. Because more than anything in this passage, you can see that God wants us to walk in unity. He wants us to plant our feet in the soil of his church and say, I'm not going to worship God just with my hands, but I'm going to worship by pouring out my life, by loving and serving each other. And believing ultimately that the best is yet to come. That's the mark of humility. Humility doesn't flash one time. Humility shines. It shines. Humility isn't something that you just do on Sunday or one day a week, but humility is something you do every single day of the week. Can I get an amen? Hey, would you all pray with me? Father, we love you, and we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your joy, God, that you put in the heart of every believer. God and I, thank you for being a forgiving God. Thank you for being a merciful God. God, when we think about the awe of you in our life, God, let us never get over that moment. And maybe you're here this morning, and the fact of the matter is you have never really experienced true salvation from Christ. You've never really understood the fact that God loves you so much that he saw there is no other way you to ever gain heaven for eternity without his son Jesus and Jesus poured out everything he had for you and the beautiful thing about the gospel is he doesn't force it upon you he offers it to you as a free gift you simply recognize it and you and you feel the nudging of the Holy Spirit and you receive this precious free gift and you invite him into your life you say Travis what do I need to do to really invite Christ to my life. The first thing is just admit that you're a sinner. And you believe that Jesus came, lived, died, was buried, and rose again. You believe that with your heart. And finally, you invite him in. You open up the door of your heart and you say, God, I invite you into my heart and my life. And let me tell you something, my friend, when that happens, your life is forever changed because now you're in line, in tune with the God that created you, the God that knows you best. And let me tell you something, there's no better position for you to be in than that. But it starts with just this simple decision. Just say, you know what, God, I, I receive it. I receive this gift. If you're here today, you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Or if you're here today and if you drifted away from God and, man, the culture and the society and everything the world has to offer is just kind of cause you just to drift away from the path that God has for you. And you just say, you know what, Travis, I need to be saved today. I need to be born again. I need to recommit my life to Christ. What I want to do is just lead you in a prayer. The Bible says if you call upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved. It is with your heart that you believe and confess. Oh, friend, I invite you to do that. Just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord, 
I repent of my sins. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. God, right here and right now, I invite you into my life. I, I surrender my life to you right here and right now, God. I'm not perfect. I got a long way to go, God, but I surrender my life to you, Lord. I accept this free gift. Deliver me, Lord, and set me free. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Just with every head bowed, every eye closed, what I wanted you to do is just make an acknowledgement that you said that prayer. Either it's a first-time commitment or it's a recommitment. And what I'm going to do is count to three. And when I hit three, I want you to raise up your hand. The Bible says if you're ashamed of him, he's ashamed of you. If you acknowledge him, he acknowledges you. So I'm going to give you a chance just to, hey, Travis, I made that decision. I'm going to hit three. When I hit three, I want you to shoot up your hand. Don't let anything hold you back. One, Jesus Christ loved you so much he died for you. Two, he was buried and rose again. Three, just raise up your hand all over the auditorium. Raise it up real high. Man, God bless you. I, God bless you two guys. God bless you. God bless you. Keep it up real high. Real high. God bless you over here. Amen. I see four, five, six hands go up. Amen. 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 I'm going to invite just to stand up. Keep praying, Father, right now, God. We rejoice with the angels in heaven. God, you moved in this place. Today's a new day in the heart and lives of, of men and women who committed or recommitted their lives to you. God, and I pray, God, you put a desire in their heart, God, just to know you. A desire in their heart, God, just to connect with you through prayer, through worship, through reading your word, leaning in the scripture, trusting in you, God. Let it happen, Lord, in each and every one of their hearts and their lives, Lord. Just to stay faithful and committed to this community of believers, Lord. God, you're, you're an awesome and a mighty God. And Father, I also pray right now as we just open up this altar, God, that people would just have freedom just to lay down every burden, every, every joy barrier, every obstacle in relationships that may be out there, every other obstacle that may be out there, God, that just seeks to, to steal our joy. We just lay it at the feet of Jesus. So God, I just ask that you just have your way in the hearts of your people. We won't let anything hold us back from your presence. God, we commit it all to your glory. And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Friend, our praise team is going to lead us just in a time of response. If you've got anything to pray about, we got, I'm up here. We've got other staff members up here. We would love to pray with you. Please understand, this is a holy moment. There's something that happens in the quietness of a moment that doesn't happen any other time because it's the one time of the week where really you're quiet. And you're really letting the Holy Spirit just speak to you. I invite you just to come and just lay those burdens down. Just lay those situations down and let God, let God have them. Let God have them.